Hey everyone, welcome to this workshop, Recruiter Insights and Tips to Land the Job, hosted by Grow with Google. Grow with Google helps people grow their skills, careers, and businesses by offering free digital skills trainings and tools. I'm Basim, one of the instructors here at Grow with Google, and I'm excited you've joined us today. On behalf of the entire team, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'd also like to give a special shout out to all our Grow with Google partners, including our partners, the Google Startup Foundation and Washington County Free Library for sharing this event with people in their communities and hosting virtual viewing parties. In this workshop, we're going to go over tips and tricks for creating a resume and cover letter that showcases your experience and skills. Then we'll talk about how to give an interview that will help you shine. We've designed this workshop in consultation with some of Google's recruiters who share their ideas of ways job seekers can help themselves stand out from the crowd. Uh, you'll hear from them, as well as recruiters from our other Google Career Certificate Employer Consortium, including Deloitte, SAP, and Charter, later in this workshop, um, as they share their knowledge about improving your resume, cover letter, and interview skills. Uh, you'll le leave with a list of changes you can make to help your resume stand out to recruiters. You'll also learn a few strategies to writing cover letters to connect with hiring managers and get some inside information on how to prepare for and nail the interview. In this workshop, I'm working with uh, Google recruiters Isela and Sydney. Later, I'll pass it off to them to answer some of your questions live at the end of the workshop. Uh, we want this to be as helpful as possible, so please post your questions directly under this live stream video. We'll choose those top voted questions to answer live later on, so please make sure to upvote your favorites. If we don't get to answer all of your posted questions, our team will reply and answer you directly in the Q&A shortly after the virtual event concludes. If you'd like to access the additional resources for this class, check out the resources section below the video player on the right-hand side. This includes a copy of today's presentation. Uh, you'll also be able to access a replay of this virtual event in the future by clicking on demand on the Growth Google On Air homepage. Also, don't forget to post and share on social using hashtag Grow with Google. Finally, you also have the option to turn on YouTube's closed caption to follow along. If you want to do that, click the closed caption button directly on the video player on your screen. All right, let's get started. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to discuss all the ways you can maximize your chances for getting the job you want. First, we'll cover resumes. Uh, we'll go over strategies you can use to help your resume get past computerized applicant tracking systems. Then we'll go through ways to impress recruiters. Along the way, you'll get hands-on time to make changes to your resume. Uh, and then we'll discuss cover letters, so you'll know when to write one and how to make sure your cover letter makes the recruiter want to call you for an interview. Uh, we'll complete this workshop by doing a deep dive into interviews. You'll build your confidence and figure out ways to address even the trickiest questions so that you make a great impression on the recruiter and hiring managers and land the job you want. To get the most from this workshop, we suggest you have a copy of your resume handy and the job description for roles you want to apply for. Uh, but this is completely optional, not mandatory. And either way, you'll learn lots of valuable information from our special guest recruiters. Plus, you can always rewatch this video on this page once the event is over and make changes later on. All right, so let's start by talking about the tool that will open the most doors in your job search, <laughs> your resume. Uh, did you know that recruiters spend an average of six to 10 seconds looking at a resume? Uh, this means that your resume needs to be skimmable and grab their attention fast so they want to learn more about you. Uh, we're going to hear some great tips straight from the recruiters themselves on what makes a strong resume. More and more companies have begun using ETS or applicant tracking systems. Uh, to sort through resumes, uh, ATS is a type of software that sorts through resumes and applications, selecting which ones to pass on to human recruiters. Uh, ATS helps recruiters by streamlining the review process and allows them to quickly and easily track, review, and identify applicants. For candidates, this means that if you want a recruiter to ever see your resume, you need to make sure it gets through the ATS. Uh, these systems work by scanning resumes for certain keywords and years of experience in the field based on the actual description and requirements. Unfortunately, ATS systems can't look at a resume and make thoughtful or nuanced decisions on an individual candidate the way a human can. So they may wind up eliminating certain resumes due to formatting or other issues that keep them from being able to read the resume. Here are a few tips to help you make sure your resume makes it through an ATS and into the hands of a human recruiter. The image on the right is of a resume that meets the requirements I'm about to mention. First, use the right file type. Right? ATS systems are best able to read docx and PDF files. If you're creating a resume using Google Docs, you can simply download it as a docx or a PDF. Either or works, doesn't matter. Uh, keep your formatting simple. 
Since ATS scans resumes for keywords, it can be confused from fancy formatting, graphics, or even tables, multiple columns, and text boxes. Uh, if an ATS isn't able to read your resume, it will reject it. So keep your formatting relatively simple. Uh, use keywords from the job description. Uh, ATS systems are shown the job listing in order to learn which words to seek out in resumes. So when the ATS detects those keywords in your resume, it will flag you as a qualified candidate. Uh, for this reason, you should adjust your resume to reflect the words used in the actual job listing. Uh, avoid headers and footers. Uh, many ATS systems can't read headers and footers as well. Uh, so make sure you don't put any critical information like your contact info in a header or footer. All right, so here's Sydney to tell you more about applicant tracking systems. Hey, Grow with Google Learners. I'm Sydney from Google, and I'm here to help you better understand how tracking systems work and how to tailor your resume to increase your chances of it being seen by a recruiter. An applicant tracking system is commonly used by companies to help hiring teams track and review candidates. So when you apply online to a careers page, your resume often moves into a scanning system, which essentially looks for resumes and applications that closely align with the job description and qualifications required. The scanning system can also help reduce bias in the screening process since it will filter based on the skills, experiences, and qualifications that are needed for the role. The big takeaway here is that the systems look for indicators that you meet the minimum requirements of the job description or that your resume has strong relevance to the role that you're applying for. So make sure to carefully to make sure to carefully review the job listing and description and then tailor your resume to reflect as much of the requirements and keywords outlined on the listing. For example, let's say you're an analyst and the job description requires SQL experience. You have this program experience, but you have not explicitly listed it on your resume. Make sure to go back, add it to your resume so that it's recognized during the scanning process. Another example, now let's say you have 10 years of experience in a full-time role um, with relevance to the job description, but the job description requires 15 years of experience. You will likely be automatically rejected from the system. Ensure that your resume speaks directly to the minimum requirements with bullets focused on impact and accomplishments. While you may not always have the exact experience listed, it's also important that you highlight other skills and accomplishments outlined on the job listing, such as, self-starter, experience in public speaking, led teams, increased sales. I'm a big believer in writing a resume for the job you want, so make sure the system can identify the similarities in your current role and previous roles. Unfortunately, scanning systems are not great guessers, so make it really obvious that this role matches your experience and skills to ensure your resume makes it into the hands of a recruiter. It's a good idea to have several customized versions of your resume. Recruiters notice when job candidates use information from a job listing in their resume. By doing this, you're showing recruiters that you are attentive to detail and invested in their specific job. Uh, so take a look at this example. The listing is for a marketing manager role and the employer is seeking someone with four years marketing experience, experience managing a large budget, experience coordinating large scale events, uh, and proficiency in SQL, uh, a language used to communicate with databases. Uh, so how can the person applying for this job work these requirements into the resume? The first requirement, four years of marketing experience, uh, will be the easiest to demonstrate since their previous job will show that they've been in a marketing role uh, for at least four years, right? Uh, so you can see here that this resume prominently calls out the applicant's experience with a $1 million marketing budget, as well as coordinating large events. And the final requirement, SQL proficiency, is noted in the skill section. Uh, this person put SQL at the top of their list since SQL was listed as a requirement in the job description. Strong action verbs can make a big impact as well. Some ideas of words you can incorporate in your bullet points are managed, negotiated, led, reinvented, designed, oversaw. Uh, choosing the right word can help catch a recruiter's eye as they scan through resumes. Uh, in a bit, I'll hand it over to Sheila to tell us more about keywords that impress recruiters like her. For example, uh, if you replace a bullet point in your resume that says, made a new scheduling process with something like expedited the scheduling process by launching a new format, uh, then you're not only offering a detailed achievement, you're also showing your ability to be creative and thoughtful through your word choice. So what are some good action words in your opinion? Type them into the chat. 
And while you're doing that, uh, here's Sheila with some more information on keywords that catch recruiters' interests. Hi, Grow with Google Learners. I'm Sheila from Deloitte. Today, I'm going to talk to you about keywords on a resume. So you've got your baseline resume, you've got your main bullet points listed for each role. Now you want to make sure it translates to the job you're applying for. The best way to position yourself for success is to utilize keywords throughout your resume. What that means is that you are choosing words on your resume that directly correlate to the job you are applying for. The reason for that is there are recruiters out there literally combing through hundreds of resumes per job posting. So many applicants will apply with a lot of qualifications, but oftentimes there are specific requirements and keywords that recruiters must have in an application in order to present them to hiring managers. For example, if you're applying for a Java developer role and, you're, and you are a Java developer, you're already one step ahead from someone else who's applying who may not be in that current uh, position. Let's say you're a graphic designer seeking a career change. You're now applying against other people who are already a Java developer. So you're one step ahead if you can at least list that as your job title. Next, it's even better to be detailed and specific in what you list after that job title. So let's say the job description calls for specific modules or languages within Java, such as Spring. You'll know this is a critical module since it would be listed under one of the first bullet points in the requirements section. So if you see that, you want to make sure you are then in turn listing that module in your summary up top and in the first bullet points under your current role. The more times you can list it throughout your resume, the better. So even if it's been five years or so when you last touched it in a previous role, still list it again. The point is that the more times you list it throughout the resume, the better. Because what the recruiter will be doing is using that find search engine in Word, typing in spring and seeing how many times it's highlighted throughout the resume. So if your resume highlights it 10 times, you'll look that much more appealing than the next candidate who it only lists two times. This, this concept applies to any other requirement as well that you see listed on the job description. So just like you did with the spring, you wanna do the same with any other module that you have experience with that's required and list it in the top uh, under the summary, and again, list it in your bullet points under your current role and previous roles. So now that was an example specific to a module. I also just wanted to touch on in general, some positive keywords to use. Something I tend to do is look for words that indicate some type of lead role with, within a project or within your current role. For example, words like executed, managed, oversaw a project. Anything that indicates you took one step ahead, you, you, were, you were critical to the execution of a certain project and, and showing that you were in some type of lead role. I do look for that. Um, and then another thing that's sometimes overlooked is a certification. It's, it's sometimes something people don't list on a resume. You wanna make sure if you hold any certifications that you list that not only in the summary at the top, but even in its own section at the bottom, you know, certifications uh, achieved and list those there. Sometimes that's something that we, we tend to look for in our keyword search. So that's about it. I hope that's been helpful and good luck with your job search. Now let's put the bullet points in your experience section to work. You'll want to be sure your resume focuses on accomplishments instead of tasks. This is a great way to stand out and explain the value you added to the company. The formula is verbs plus accomplishments plus impact. Um, basically, by writing each bullet point this way, you're explaining what you did and why it matters. This is especially helpful to a recruiter who is unfamiliar with your specific role. Start with one or two action verbs uh, to describe what you did in your job. Follow that with the actual accomplishment. Then complete your bullet point with the quantifiable impact this accomplishment had. Uh, so this is an example for a project manager role. Designed and implemented a new communication and accountability process which cut weekly meeting time by 50%. So this example starts with the action words designed and implemented. 
uh, then mentions the accomplishment. In this case, the communication and accountability process finally gives us the result, 50% less time spent in weekly meetings. This formula works because it doesn't just create a list of tasks and responsibility, it also helps you to elaborate on your tasks and responsibilities in a way that responds directly to the job listing. All right, so here's another example for a sales team manager. Oversaw a diverse 18-person team to increase our sales goals of 15,000 per day by over 20% over a six-month period uh, by incorporating new sales strategies and retraining sales associates on conversion. Uh, this one gets bonus points because it uses uh, a keyword that Sheila recommended over Zola. Now, edit one of the bullet points on your resume using this formula, or write down a new bullet point from scratch. Uh, bonus points if you tailor it to the actual job description. I'll give you a minute to complete this activity. All right, so when you write about the things you've accomplished through your career, whenever possible, use numbers or metrics to quantify what you've done. Metrics are a powerful way to quickly make a case for yourself to a new employer. They provide evidence of the value brought to your former jobs. So like put yourself in a recruiter's shoes, which one paints a better picture about a candidate? Surpasses team sales goals or oversaw a diverse 18 person team to increase sales goals by 20%. The more relevant and quantifiable details you can add, the better. A lot of you are probably wondering, so how about managing career gaps in your resume? Uh, people need to take time off from the workplace for a variety of reasons, including care for loved ones or the further education. Now, they may also lose their job due to an economic downturn. Uh, in many places, employers legally can't ask about gaps in a candidate's work history or discriminate against them for having time off the workforce. Uh, still, if you have a gap in your work history for any reason, whether for months or for years, it's possible that employers might ask about it. Uh, you can try to minimize gaps by experimenting with different resume formats. Uh, our guest recruiter, uh, Matthew from Charter, has some actual great advice uh, and examples on how to actually do this, uh, which we'll explain in a minute, so stay tuned. Uh, on your resume, you might want to highlight the education or volunteer work that you did during the time. Uh, you can also describe the experience and skills you've gained even when you were un unemployed. Uh, in the resume on this slide, you can see a gap from February to August 2018. This candidate chose to include volunteer work that she did while looking for her next role. Uh, she included details about the time she spent volunteering that may interest potential employers. Uh, however you choose to handle the gap in your resume, be prepared to address it in your cover letter and discuss uh, discuss it in an interview in case it comes up. Uh, we'll talk more about how to do that in those sections later on. All right, so now we'll hear from Matthew about his advice on how to handle gaps in your work history. Hey, Grow With Google Learners. I'm Matthew Schaap from Charter. The best way to position career gaps on your resume is to minimize how much they stand out. When most people complete a resume, they put the month and year they started. However, that is never a requirement. Best thing to do, regardless of whether or not you have any gaps, is to just put the years. For example, 2018 to 2020. That gives you a little bit of wiggle room if you have a short gap, less than a year, so it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb. If you have a significant gap that you want to minimize, think about doing a functional resume format 
versus a chronological one. A functional resume can be a bit more time consuming to put together, especially if you've not been doing the same type of job, for example, marketing. However, it's a great way to minimize the look of those gaps and let the employer really hone in on your skill set. Plus, on a functional resume, you list your employers and years at the bottom. Remember, as I stated earlier, I would still only give the years and not the month. It's best to not divulge personal information on your resume that is not job or career related. Now, if you're going back to school, I recommend moving your education portion back to the top of your resume to ensure that it's highlighted that your career gap is because you're back in school. Resume summaries are brief statements that are used by candidates to introduce themselves, speak to the professional goals, and let recruiters know what their strengths are along with what type of role they're looking for. Summaries are usually found at the top of a resume uh, and can be useful if you're making a big career change or if you're just starting your career and don't have a lot of relevant work experience to include in your resume. Now I'll hand it back to Matthew to give us some of his thoughts on summaries. To me, a well-written summary replaces the objective portion on a resume and should always be at the top. You may see resume templates out there with objective listed. However, employers know your objective as you applied for their job. The hard part is determining how to write a great summary that captures the employer's attention. Let's call it your elevator pitch. On average, you have 15 to 20 seconds in an elevator and you need to maximize the impact you make. Think about how you would do it verbally and then translate it to your resume. A summary is really your career and skill set into one, maybe two short paragraphs. A summary is going to be much easier if you're applying to a job in which you have a skill set for. I personally find it helpful to complete a short one paragraph summary, about three to five sentences. That paragraph should include your general experience, relevant job experience, and maybe a top achievement. Then underneath that paragraph, list some top bullets that describe your skill set best. Strong problem solving, people leadership, etc. In the experience section of your resume, limit yourself to five or fewer bullet points per job. Make sure each of those bullet points are relevant to the job you're actually applying for. The image on the right shows a work experience from someone's resume with four concise bullet points. Try to keep your resume down to one or two pages unless you have a very long work history. Uh, as a general rule, limit yourself to one page per every 10 years of work history. Recruiters don't need more than that to know if you're a potential fit for the role they're actually trying to fill. If possible, leave plenty of white space on the page to make it easier for the recruiter to scan the resume quickly. All right, so now that we've talked about what makes a strong resume, I'll turn it over to Nancy, our guest recruiter from SAP, who will share what mistakes to avoid. Hey, Growth Google Learners, I'm Nancy from SAP. There are countless resources that cover the best resume tips and things to include, but what about what not to do? Here are my top five resume mistakes to avoid. Number one, adding too much information. So try to keep your resume concise and focus on highlights and impact versus tasks and minutia. Use action verbs and showcase how you made a difference in that role. In that same vein, that brings us to number two, trying to cram too much onto one page. Formatting makes all the difference in the world for recruiters who look at many resumes every day. Using small text or messy formatting can make it more confusing to the other party when reviewing your credentials. A clean, organized layout goes a long way. Number three, not tailoring your resume to every role you're applying to. I know, sometimes that extra step can feel like a lot when you've already taken the time to build a stellar resume. But be sure to look at the job advert you're interested in and see if you can add any key elements to your resume to stand out. Trust me, it makes a difference. Number four, forgetting important links. Always include your LinkedIn, portfolio, or anything else that may help boost your consideration for that role. And finally, number five, you probably already know what this is, but typos and grammatical errors. With so many tools available to spell check, there are many options to ensure that you avoid this. Also, try to get another person to review your resume to ensure you didn't miss anything, because after all, we're only human. Good luck with your job search. You've got this. Until recently, cover letters were requested for the majority of job application. These days, they aren't always required, 
Still, there are some cases where it's a good idea to include one with your resume, like if you're applying to a job that requires writing skills. Before you spend time on the cover letter, make sure it's either required or requested by the hiring manager, or it will increase your chances of earning an interview. In some cases, like if you have limited work experience or are making a major change, a cover letter can be a good opportunity to express how your skill set and experience can be an asset to the organization. Cover letters can also be a great place to explain time you spent away from the workplace or to write about other issues on your resume that might raise questions for recruiters. Now we'll hear from Isela, who will share her advice about writing a cover letter. Hey, Grow with Google Learners. I'm Isela from Google, and I'm here to share with you a little bit about how to craft a strong cover letter. First, let's start with what is a cover letter. Think of it as an opportunity to share your story with a potential employer. It's an opportunity to add supplemental information to that of your resume. Is it absolutely required? If an employer is asking for one, then definitely yes. This is more than likely a standard part of the review process. What if it's not a requirement? Then it depends. I believe that while an employer may not require a cover letter, it can be helpful to add additional context and color to your experience beyond just what's on your resume. However, if a cover letter is the only thing stopping you from applying to a role, don't let that stop you from being considered. In my experience, hiring managers will often begin reviewing resumes first. However, if and when their interest in someone is piqued, but they may be on the fence, the cover letter can oftentimes make or break the hiring manager's decision to move forward to interview. When in doubt, create a custom cover letter. So what do we in recruiting like to see in these? It should be clear and concise, well-researched and true to you. Important note here, research the job description and ensure that your career highlights touch on aspects of the role. Along with these highlights, you can expand on some of the following if it's relevant to your search. Are you looking to make a career change? Are you moving to a new area? And were you recently affected by a layoff or other major life change that you'd like to explain? Overall, ensure that the focus is on how your specific skills and experience could be a great addition to the hiring team. Now, let's touch on a few less than ideal points on cover letters. Do not use a standardized template. Hiring managers and recruiters may look at hundreds of applications for a given role, and seeing templatized cover letters becomes very apparent. Avoid going beyond one page. Being concise is the name of the game. And avoid grandiose verbiage. Oftentimes, we'll read where someone will say that they're the perfect fit or the only person for the job. That's much less impactful than if you were to show us how you'd be great for the job and not assume that it's yours for the taking. Additionally, do not omit important information from your resume and only include in the cover letter. There will be certain teams who may not have the time to read your cover letter first. So if it's a requirement in the job description, make sure it lands loud and clear on your resume. In summary, the first step in sharing your story and brand with a potential employer is by crafting a cover letter. Keep it clear, concise, impactful, and personal. Be sure to highlight the reasons you want to make the role change and focus on how your transferable skills can provide value in this new role. Is it always necessary? Maybe not. However, you never know, it might just help you stand out from the crowd. Every cover letter will be a bit different, but there are three major things to address in any cover letter. First is who you are. In many cases, this is your first real contact with a recruiter or a hiring manager. So write about why you want to work for this company or team specifically. Uh, this is a great place to mention your professional background or any connection you have with the company. Uh, the second thing to address is any issue that may come up when a recruiter or hiring manager is reading your resume. Uh, for example, lack of experience in the field or a gap in your resume. Last, uh, touch on what you have to offer the company. Maybe it's a skill set they're looking for. Or maybe it's just a passion for the job. If you know about a specific pain point that the company or team is struggling with, mention how you can help. All right, so now I'm going to hand it back to Isela, who has some tips about getting noticed when you are making a career change into a new industry. This piece of advice is going to be for those of you who may be looking to make a change in your careers. First and foremost, do your research to understand the specific requirements for the role you'd like to pursue. Talk to folks in your network who have positions similar to the one you want, find out what the position entails, and ask how to stand out as a contender. 
It may also help to learn whether or not there are any specific requirements that the job advertisements don't mention, such as specific programs, skills, or certifications. With that, it's a great idea to network. For example, if you don't have the desired level of experience, it helps to get buy-in from relevant folks in the industry. From those partnerships, get your contacts to recommend you. Employers are more likely to overlook the gap in your experience if you come with a recommendation from someone they can trust. Additionally, consider if your current organization has opportunities to learn from or work with folks in your desired career path. Oftentimes, organizations will have more faith hiring you in a role you've never had if you've proven yourself in your current role. Use your cover letter to your advantage. A cover letter allows you to share aspects of your personality, experience, and qualifications with the hiring manager that you may not have fully fleshed out in your resume. Use your cover letter to tell your story, and be sure to highlight the reasons why you went and make a career change and focus on how your transferable skills can provide value in the new field. Your cover letter should be specific and persuasive. If you are missing critical skills for a specific position, address this in your cover letter and explain how your past work experience can be useful in the new industry. Emphasize your desire to learn and provide details of the steps you have taken to make your career transition possible, i.e. additional courses, ad hoc projects, side hustles, or volunteer work. And to that point, it can be extremely important to highlight your transferable experiences within your resume as well. Once you've done your research and understand the core skills and competencies needed to be successful in the role, you want to highlight that in your own experience. For example, skill sets like project management, sales, budgeting, or cross-functional collaboration and partnership span multiple industries. In summary, when aiming to make a career change, ensure you do your homework, connect with others in your company and or desired industry, tell your story, and highlight your best transferable skills. An in-person interview or remote interview is your chance to make a great impression and let potential employers get to know you. It's an opportunity to share the value you can bring to a new role and express your enthusiasm. In addition to making a great impression, you also get the opportunity to learn about whether the new role, company, and hire manager are a good fit for you. Uh, the interview tips and exercises in this section were created to make sure you feel confident, comfortable, and be prepared when you show up for your interview, whether it's in-person or virtual, so you'll be able to bring the best possible version of yourself into the room. All right, let's get started by hearing from Matthew, who will explain how to make a strong impression in your interview. First, the old adage of dress for success is one of the most important aspects of making a great impression. Even if you know a company is super casual, make sure you dress yourself up a bit. Maybe a business suit isn't needed, but at least a more dressed up business casual outfit. It's always better to overdress than underdress. Arrive early, but not too early. I'll, ideal arrival is about five to 10 minutes before your interview. It lets you get settled, take a breather, and gather your thoughts before the interview. Always bring a copy of your resume. Regardless if you know the interviewer has it, you want to bring a copy for them to offer. Have a nice pad and paper to take notes. Be sure to ask the interviewer if it's okay but if they say no, I'd highly question if you really even want to work there. But taking notes shows your enthusiasm and desire while simultaneously allowing you to return home and review your notes. When we're nervous, we often forget many details that could be important, and taking a few notes will help spark that memory bank. Eye contact, energy, and smile. Need I say more? If you have a choice, schedule the interviewer when you feel your best. Are you a morning person? Maybe afternoon. Now, take those great notes and craft a great follow-up thank you letter to them. If the interviewer did not provide you a business card, virtual or otherwise, get it from the recruiter or take initiative and maybe find them on LinkedIn. Be resourceful. Ensure your thank you letter is not just a generic thank you letter where you change a few words. Customize it and let them know how interested you are in the role. Make it stand out. Email thank you notes are perfectly acceptable. If you want to send a handwritten note, feel free, but I also recommend sending an email one beforehand. You never know if that handwritten note will make it to their desk. 
Okay, prepare for your interview by researching the organization. It can show that you're motivated and can even help you think of good questions to ask your interviewer. Visit the company's website and social media accounts, but also check professional networking sites and look for recent news articles. Now, there are also websites that feature reviews from current and former employees. This can be a great resource for learning what challenges the company may be facing internally. As you do your research, you're likely to have questions. Write them down so you remember them during the actual interview process. Imagine you sit down for your interview and the first question you hear is, tell me about yourself. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to answer that out loud the way you would in an interview. Don't think about it too hard, just do your best. All right, you ready? And go. So how did that feel? Let us know in the chat. Um, it's not always easy to speak when you're asked such a broad question. That's why we're going to spend a little time talking about your elevator pitch, which Matthew mentioned earlier, right? Uh, it's a quick summary of what you have to offer. The term elevator pitch comes from the idea uh, that if an important executive stepped into an elevator with you, you could pitch them on your product or service before the elevator arrived at its destination. Let's explore the components of a good elevator pitch during an interview. You can approach your elevator pitch several different ways, but for now, let's keep it simple. You'll want your elevator pitch to cover who you are, what you have to offer, and why you're interested in the position. As you did with your resume, it's a good idea to tell your elevator pitch to the job you're applying for. Identify those qualities and experiences the recruiter and hiring manager are looking for, then make sure your elevator pitch speaks directly to them. Here's one example of an elevator pitch. I'm an educator with X years of experience teaching people of all ages. I currently design curriculum that teach people valuable skills to help people get high paying jobs. And when a pandemic hit, I led a team to set up a fully virtual version of our training program, which allowed us to reach thousands at a time. I'm interviewing here today because I'm passionate about helping people access the technology and training they need to achieve their goals. As a lead educator, I'm here to help you achieve that at scale. Now that we walk through how to answer, tell me about yourself, let's talk about how you want to answer the other questions that come your way. Uh, the questions that are asked in an interview are generally behavioral or situational. Uh, behavioral questions help employees to get a better idea of who you are and how you conduct yourself in the job. Uh, they're based on past experiences. Uh, here's an example of a behavioral question. Think about a time that you needed something important from a colleague, but they weren't responding to it. How did you handle it? Uh, one way to respond to questions like this is using the STAR method. You can use this method to practice answering questions ahead of time uh, so you're comfortable by the time you interview. To use the STAR method to respond to questions, follow this structure. Situation, set the scene and give the necessary details about your example. Task, describe what your responsibility was in the situation. Action, explain exactly what steps you took to address it. Result, share the outcomes your actions achieved. Situational questions deal with hypothetical situations and are asked to determine what you would do in a situation. Uh, like for example, what would you do if you were assigned a task that you have never done before? All right, so I'm going to give you a bunch of common interview questions to practice with, but first let's look at one star response uh, for another question. Uh, tell me about a time you acted as a leader. Uh, and so here is an example response. All right, so first things first, you want to set up the situation. When my team needed to deliver a big end of your report, we were short three people due to illness. Then you explain the task and your responsibility. I was usually second in command of my team, but my manager was out for a conference that week, so I was in charge. Next, you describe the action you took. We were falling behind schedule with no available help, so I made the call to split up our team based on our skill sets. I directed the strongest designer to create the presentation itself, while the rest of the team focused on creating the written copy for the presentation. And you finish with your, with your response with the result of your action, including a quantifiable detail when it's possible. 
Splitting your team up into two made the work more manageable. By the end of the week, we were actually ahead of schedule by two hours and the presentation got positive reviews from leadership. All right, now I'm going to list some commonly asked interview questions. Uh, after we go through the questions, you can choose one to answer. Remember to use the STAR method to structure your response. I'll give you a minute to type it into the chat, write it down on a piece of paper, or practice saying it out loud. All right, so why do you want to work for this company? Of all the candidates we were interviewing, uh, why should we hire you? What do you consider is your biggest professional achievement? Why are you leaving your current job? How would you deal with an angry customer or coworker? Tell me about a time you acted as a leader. All right, so choose one of these questions. I'll give you a minute to answer it. You can answer the chat, write down your answer privately, or try to answer it out loud. So now let's actually talk about the information interviewers may be hoping to get from these particular questions. So why do you want to work for this company? The answer you give shows whether you're aligned with the company's missions and values. Uh, so we talk about of all the candidates we're interviewing, why should we hire you? Your answer shows which unique traits you have that will add value to the company. What do you consider is your biggest professional achievement? Uh, your answer shows what you've accomplished in your career, but also which of these accomplishments you value most. Uh, so this one's tricky. Why are you leaving your current job? Uh, your answer may reveal that, you know, some difficulties you've had in your last job, uh, like trouble getting along with people. Um, on the other hand, if you're pivoting your career, it can be a great way to open up the conversation and explain why. Uh, this will give interviewers helpful content to understand your overall career path. And the next one, how would you deal with an angry customer or coworker? Uh, your answer shows how you deal with conflict and whether you have good problem solving skills. And last one, what are you looking for in a new role? Uh, your answer shows, you know, if you are looking, what you're actually looking for matches what the role can actually offer you. The goal is to make sure that you will actually be happy and successful in this new role. Chances are you'll come across some difficult questions. Uh, here are some do's and don'ts to keep in mind. Uh, don't speak badly of your former boss, company, or team. No matter how justifiable your anger or hurt feeling is about a situation, speaking bad about other people or organizations will always reflect poorly on yourself. Uh, complaining or blaming may, uh, may make you look bitter. Uh, instead, what you wanna do is share what you've learned and how you grew from a difficult situation. It's okay to acknowledge that circumstances or events were as challenging or uncomfortable, but you should always share how you managed the situation, overcame that circumstance, or even learn from it. Uh, also, when talking about some do's, do ask for a few moments to think, if you need to, right? Uh, and it might actually help you to drop down some notes. Uh, it's important to remember that employers aren't expecting you to be superhuman. Just go in, do your best, and be proud of your accomplishments and excited about everything you have to offer. All right, and now with the interview done, there are just a few more items to take care of. Let's hear from Nancy about how to follow up uh, after the interview process. Then Sydney will offer some advice on providing references. You did it. You landed an interview and had an opportunity to flex your skills. Hopefully you took some light notes during your interview because these can be useful for the follow-up. 
Always send a thank you note to each individual you interviewed with, ideally no later than one business day after your interview, including the recruiter. Keep it short and sweet, but include something special from your time with them. Maybe it was a funny moment or something interesting they shared about their experience or background. If you're still interested in the role, reiterate your interest and why you were a great fit for the position and company. If you're no longer interested, because after all, interviews are two-way streets, include why you would like to remove yourself from consideration and thank them for their time. If you felt you missed something important during your interview, that's okay because it happens to all of us. Perhaps mention it in your note and offer to have a follow-up chat if needed. In any instance, it's helpful to ask for a time frame of when you can expect to hear back if they haven't shared already in order to set those expectations. If they don't get back to you by that date, don't panic. Give it another two to three business days and then send another short note to reiterate your interest. However, if something urgent or time sensitive pops up on your end sooner than the agreed upon date, it's perfectly okay to reach back out and let them know, especially if you receive another offer. Try to avoid sending too many notes as that comes off as pushy as opposed to engaged. But ultimately, agreeing upon timelines and including a personal touch goes far when following up after interviews. You've got this. All right, now that you've completed the workshop, make sure to go back through your resume to take out any format issues that might prevent it from passing through those applicant tracking systems. Then complete any improvements you might have already started. Uh, you also want to revise your resume bullet points using that formula, verbs plus accomplishments plus impact. Uh, when you do this, use actions, words, and metrics. Uh, prepare for future interviews by crafting your letter pitch so that you can briefly tell someone who you are what you have to offer and why you're interviewing for the job. Finally, practice your answers to those common few questions like, why do you wanna work for this company? And why should we hire you over other candidates? Make sure to use that STAR method, situation, task, action, and result. If you're looking to start a new career and land a competitively paid job or build skills to grow in your career, check out Google Career Certificates. Google Career Certificates can give you a path to in-demand jobs with top employers that are currently hiring, including the employers you heard from today, uh, SAP, Deloitte, and Charter. You can earn a certificate and prepare for a new career in a high growth field in under six months, even if you don't have any relevant experience. Learn at your own pace and complete the online program on your own terms. Certificates are currently available for IT support, project management, UX design, data analytics, and Android development. We're also excited to share that our Google Career Certificates are recommended by the American Council on Education, the industry standard for translating workplace learning into college credit. Learners can earn a recommendation of up to 12 college credits for completing the Google Career Certificates at participating universities. And stay tuned to Growth Google Air to keep growing your digital skills to help you stay connected and productive while working and managing business remotely. Uh, for more information, visit g.co slash grow on air. I wish I had time to thank every Growth Google partner. We truly appreciate your work supporting job seekers in your communities. Uh, four of our partners shared additional tips, which you can find in the PDF handout in the resources section below the video player on the right. This wraps up the presentation portion of today's workshop. Major thank you to our employers, Deloitte, Charter, and SAP, and our guest recruiters, Sydney, Isela, Matthew, Sheila, Nancy, who all shared such helpful tips today. Now, give us a few moments to pass it off to Sydney and Isela, who will answer some of the questions you've all submitted. We will see you next time. Hi everyone, I'm Sydney and I'm here with my colleague Estella and we're so excited to answer a few of the questions you've asked throughout the session today. We've received quite a few of them. So remember, if we don't get to your question, we'll go back and answer a lot of them on the Grow with Google on air page below the virtual event shortly after this session concludes. Our first question today is from Austin and he asked a great question. How should I pick my references for my application and resume? 
Um, so, hey, Austin, thanks for your question again. Um, when thinking about references, it's always great to think about who knows you best. So really important to ask yourself a couple of key questions. Um, who knows you best professionally, specifically? Who have you collaborated with as a peer, a vendor, a client, or cross-functionally on a project? Who has managed you or supervised you before that would speak to your growth and performance? Um, although we'd love to get to know your neighbor and family friend, personal acquaintances are not the best references. We are looking for colleagues, clients, vendors, peers, and managers that have worked with you directly in our office setting. Um, and also, if you are applying to a role and have only had educational experience, that's totally fine. A teacher, academic advisor, club advisor, or mentor would also satisfy as a great reference. I'm going to pass it back to Asela to answer the next question. Hey, everyone. Our next question is from Fashuniti, and they asked, how can you land a junior position if you're just starting your career with most roles already ask for experience? So this is a great question. You may need to be a little creative with your experience. So you want to highlight skills that you've required in places other than just traditional jobs. As an example, you may have learned critical skills for a job in school, volunteer work, or even through extracurricular activities or side hustles. For instance, you may think that being a president in a school club isn't as important, but it is a great example of leadership experience. Alrighty, our next question is from Ani. Um, for people that are transitioning from one industry to another, what advice would you give? For example, educational leadership to technology? Great question. The best way to demonstrate your skills when making a transition is to identify the areas of overlap in your experience and on your resume and in your pitch to recruiters and the hiring team. Um, in this particular example, you'd be able to showcase how you've supported your community and educational leadership and also how um, communication is super important to the role and, and how that translates to your new area of interest. You can also look into certification programs to give you further their exposure to the area that you have interest in. So transition, transitions, excuse me, are always possible and, and important to just kind of uh, evaluate the skills that you have and, and how you can add value in the next role. Our next question is from Nancy who asks, what if you have more experience? Most roles ask for seven to eight years. Would you have 10 or 15 years of experience? So most of the time, a requirement in a job description is asking for minimum years of experience. So having more experience than what is required shouldn't be an issue. Additionally, when in doubt, um, ensure you're only highlighting relevant years of experience, meaning if you've worked in a different industry previously, you may not need to include these years on your resume. Great. Our next question is from Michaela. When going through the recruiting process, what advice can you give on interview tips? Um, a couple of quick tips uh, that I would recommend would be always tailor your resume for the job you want. Know your professional story and what you want to accomplish next. And always have great questions prepared for your interviewers about the team, the culture, and their goals. There are also so many great tips highlighted in the video today. And you'll be able to re-watch this event on demand in our um, live stream library after this concludes. So definitely check that out um, and all the other available videos in the on-demand section of uh, Grow with Google on your website. Our next question is from Alice, who asks, how important is LinkedIn in getting called in for an interview or a phone screen? So great question. LinkedIn is really your electronic business card, so it is important. I have many hiring managers who will look at candidates' LinkedIn profile before they decide whether or not they want to interview. And also, as a recruiter, oftentimes while you're looking for a job, I might be looking for you. So your LinkedIn should be just as polished as your resume. Alrighty, and our last question comes from Jasmine. Um, her question, if I had a disability such as ADHD or autism or any other, how would I go about disclosing that or selling it in an interview? Is it better to wait until the hire or just ask about mental health resources? Thanks so much for your question, Jasmine. Keep in mind that employers cannot and never should discriminate against you for a disability and they are required to make accommodations to set you up for success. 
Um, in this situation, do what makes you feel most comfortable. If you do need any accommodation in the interview process, make sure to let the recruiter or hiring manager know. This will also give you a good insight into how accommodating they will be to your needs overall. I'm going to pass it back to Asela to wrap us up. Alrighty, everyone, this wraps up our Q&A for today. Thank you so much for joining us for Recruiter Insights and Tips to Land the Job. Hopefully everyone learned something new today. You can find all of our follow-up resources on the same page you're watching in the resources tab below the video player. And you can also access the recording of today's session on demand at g.co slash grow on air. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with a survey for you to fill out regarding your experiences in this virtual workshop today. It's really important to get your feedback so we can quickly improve these sessions um, and offer content that's most helpful to you and other learners. Thanks again for joining Grow with Google today. See you next time. Bye.